have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 27. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for everybody that's here. Give me the ability to preach this message, Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me the ability to deliver this. Lord, I just pray that these people can be good ground, that we may bear fruit. Help us all to be good ground, that we may bear fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 27, verse 26. Next week we're going to be preaching on the resurrection. This Sunday I'm going to be preaching on the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever I was going through the week, typically I, I surveyed a few people, just asked a few people, what is the first thing that comes to mind whenever you hear the phrase, hell on earth? And often people think, well, it must be the great white throne judgment and the lake of fire after the great white throne judgment. And rightly so. That will be hell on earth. Some people say that the tribulation period will be hell on earth. And rightly so. Some people said wars. And rightly so. But I'm here to tell you that 2,000 years ago, hell on earth happened. Hell on earth happened at Calvary. The first point that I want to make is the torment of Calvary. Matthew 27 verse 26. Then released he Barabbas unto them... And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. If you do any research on scourging from a Roman soldier, they used this thing called a cat of nine tails. It was a whip made of leather, typically, or a whip. And it had pieces of metal or glass or nails at the tips of it. And whenever they that whip made contact... It was driving those, that glass or that metal into the Lord's back. And wherever they pull it, it is tearing flesh and meat off of His back. That is torment. And then He delivered Him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus unto the common hall and gathered unto Him the whole band of soldiers... And they stripped him and put him in a scarlet robe. And when they platted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. Whenever they put this crown of thorn on the Lord's head, these thorns went into his flesh on his head. And understand that he was already weakened from the beating. And as he carried that cross up Calvary's mountain. Every time he stumbled, every time he tripped, every time he fell, every time somebody hit him, those thorns went deeper and deeper into his skull and those thorns just scratching the edge of his skull. That is excruciating pain, torment. The torment of hell was at Calvary. And when they had platted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. They mocked him. They spit on him. They hit him. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe from from him and put his own raiment on him. And led him away to crucify him. And as they came, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by the name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. Obviously he had been weakened and he needed help. And when they were 
come unto the place of Golgotha, that is to say, the place of the skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments and casting lots that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them and upon my vesture they did cast lots. So he went through pure torment at Calvary. That is the first point, the torment of Calvary. Now let's change gears and point to the torment of hell. Let's go to Luke chapter 16 verse 23. Luke chapter 16, verse 23. This tells a story of a rich man who died and went to hell. Luke 16, 23. The Lord is speaking about this rich man. Luke 16, 23. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am, there's that word again, tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now is he comforted as thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which could, would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then, said, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. What a thing. Over and over again it says the word torment, torment, torment. Hell is a place of torment. It's not just simply a place to go to. Hell is a place of excruciating pain and you can't get a break from it. It is torment. But Calvary was a place of torment for the Lord Jesus Christ as He hung there on that cross. Next point I want to make is hell and Calvary is a place for thirsty people. Look at verse 24. And He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. This flame. The rich man was thirsty as he fell headlong, head over heels into the pit of hell. The flames licked at his body as he free falled into this place called hell. And all he could ever want, all he could ever ask for is one drop of water. One drop of water is all he ever wanted was one drop of water. And if he were to so to speak, had gotten that drop of water, it wouldn't have done him any good, but he never got that drop of water. And so therefore, the rich man is still begging for that one drop of water in hell, and it has probably been over 2,000 years since the rich man has been in hell. But also, Calvary was a place of thirst. Turn with me to John chapter 19. John chapter 19, verse 28. John 19, 28. And after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Everything that the Lord went through at Calvary is a vivid picture of the excruciating pain and torment of hell. The Lord Jesus Christ, as He baked there on that cross, He was on that cross. 
He lost a lot of blood. He is dripping a lot of blood from that cross. He lost of water through his bleeding on that cross. He lost a lot of water through the sweating and dehydration as he baked there on that cross. He probably lost a lot of water through the tears that he cried. Could you imagine the tears that he cried as he, as he hung there in excruciating pain? He probably cried tears of of sorrow for the people around him as he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. What a thing. The Lord hung there on the cross and was thirsty. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Hell is a place of thirst just like Calvary. And if you reject the one who can give you living water, you will be begging for one drop of water just like the rich man in hell. You will have, but if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he'll give you a well of water springing up into everlasting life as he promised the Samaritan woman. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 22. Psalms 22, verse 1. Psalms 22, verse 1. The very first verse. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me from the words of my roaring? And the Lord said... From the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In the presence of all them Jews who probably had this verse memorized. They probably had the 22nd Psalm memorized. And Psalm 22 is a direct prophecy of the Lord's crucifixion. That was a witness to those Jews who likely had that verse memorized. Let's look at verse 6. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They spit on me. They shake the head saying, He trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, and it melted in the midst of my bowels. Whenever that uh, whenever that soldier pierced him in the side, Blood and water come out. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. He was thirsty. And thou hast brought me unto the dust of death, for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. That is a detailed prophecy in the Old Testament of crucifixion. And he said from the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What a witness that could have been to those standing by, to those people who likely had that 22nd Psalm memorized. That is likely to be the cry, the first cry out of your mouth if you fell headlong into hell. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The very moment you stand at the great white throne judgment, the final judgment, And you hear, depart from me, you that work at the iniquity. I never knew you. And you see that nail-pierced hand to point at you. And you sink into the lake of fire. And as you struggle to swim your way to the top, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That is a cry of the sinner from hell fire. But that was also the cry of the Savior as he hung there on the cross. Calvary was indeed hell on earth. Let's look at verse 6. Psalm 22, verse 6. 
but I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. The nation of Israel stood outside of Pilate's judgment hall saying, crucify him, crucify him. He was a reproach of men. He was despised of the people. But as he hung there on the cross, it says that I am a worm. That is probably a word that they called him as he hung there on the cross. He's a worm. A worm is a, a derogatory word for somebody who is in bad shape. Somebody is in a hopeless state. But also, the people in hell are referred to as a worm. Turn to Mark chapter 9, verse 43. Mark chapter 9, verse 43. Mark chapter 9, verse 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. I was talking about the sinner in hell. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye, having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. What a thing. If you deny the Lord who died on that old rugged cross for you, if you go your life rejecting the gospel... If you reject the one who offers everlasting life to whosoever, you will be a worm in hell. Hell is a place where the fire is not quenched. You don't want to go there, friend. But I will say this. One suffered hell on earth on Calvary. One suffered hell on earth. So you will not have to go to hell. Turn with me. Y'all are in Mark. Go to Mark chapter 15. Mark 15, 27. And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. The Lord was numbered with the transgressors. He looked to his left and he could look to his right and see people in the same punishment or condemnation that he was in. He was punished and he was innocent. He hung there on a cross between two thieves. He could look to his left and he could look to his right and see other people in torment. Being in torment yourself is a terrible thing, but to look around you and see other people in the same torment that you're in, that's got to be mentally exhausting. What a thing. Imagine being in hell and looking to your right and looking to your left and seeing a, another person in the same condemnation that you're in. You will be numbered with the transgressors. Hell is a place where there's many people. You can look to, uh, in every direction and see a person in the same condemnation that you're in. Y'all are in Mark chapter 15. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 7 verse 13. Matthew chapter 7 verse 13. Matthew seven thirteen. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction. And how many? Many 
there be which go therein. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And how many? Few there be that find it. What a thing. Hell is a pretty crowded place. Could you imagine being there for all eternity, and every direction you can look is another person going through the same agonizing pain that you're in? What a thing. You could look in every direction and see somebody suffering just like you are. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ suffered hell on earth. He could look to his left and look to his right and see people suffering just like he was. He was numbered with the transgressors. And if you die without God, you will be numbered with the transgressors. You might think that you're somebody who's special. You might think somebody, that you're somebody who's tough. You might think that you're somebody who's unique. You might be a celebrity on TV. You might be a God somewhere on TV. But whenever you die without God, you're just one more lost soul. There ain't no celebrities in hell. All your status goes out the door whenever you leave this earth. The Lord was numbered with the transgressors so that you will not be numbered with the transgressors in hell. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53, verse 7. Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before his shears, is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare this generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgressions of my people, was, he was stricken. What a thing. Hold your place in Isaiah 53. We will go back to this in just a moment. Hold your place. Stick a pen or an envelope or something in this and turn with me to Revelation chapter 20. The Lord was judged before Pilate. And he was taken from prison, from prison to the judgment hall to Calvary. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. Revelation 20, 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. Is your name in that book? And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the seed that gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. There is people who have been burning in hell for thousands of years. And one day they will rise up. They'll rise up out of hell and they will stand at the great white throne judgment. And then he will judge them for their sins. And he will declare, depart from me, ye that worketh iniquity, I never knew you. And he will cast them into a worser hell called the lake of fire, where they will be bodily condemned at the lake of fire. They may try to argue. They may try to encourage otherwise. They may try to plea their cause. But they will have no other choice but agree that I'm guilty, I'm a sinner, and you were just in condemning me. And they will be sent to the lake of fire. But the Lord Jesus Christ stood before Pilate, totally innocent. Pilate washed his hands and said, I find no fault in him. And then said, let this man be crucified. 
totally innocent. And Pilate washed his hands and said, let this man be crucified. The Lord Jesus Christ was judged so you will not be judged one day. What a thing. What a thing. Pilate gave in to the request of the people instead of the justice system. He was a coward. He gave in to the people and, they, and he condemned a man that was totally innocent. Totally innocent. Let me tell you, you will not be innocent at the great white throne judgment. It only took one sin for Adam to get kicked out of the garden. It'll only take one sin for God to be just in sending you to hell. But the Lord Jesus Christ died for all sin, past, present, future. We were talking about this in Sunday school, justification. The very moment you believe the gospel, he washed you in his blood and justified you. What a thing. What a wonderful thing to be justified by the Savior. What a wonderful thing to be able to rest with absolute confidence and know that you're going to heaven one day. What a wonderful thing to know that you will never have to suffer the torment of hell. But the Lord Jesus Christ suffered your torment on that cross. He took your place on that cross. He took your place on that cross. What a thing. Turn with me back to Isaiah chapter 53. We'll pick up where we left off. The Lord was the propitiation for our sins. He took our place on that cross so we will not go to hell. We'll pick up right where we left off in Isaiah 53, verse 9. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. The wrath of God was satisfied with Calvary. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prolong his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. There's that word, justify. Justify. For he shall bear their iniquities. Aren't you glad the Lord paid for your sins at Calvary? You will never have to suffer the torment of hell because one went to the cross and suffered your hell. How much does God so love the world? For God so loved the world. How much does He so love the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him as their crucified, buried, and risen Savior. For whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What a day. What a thing. Aren't you glad you trusted Jesus Christ as your crucified, buried, and risen Savior? Aren't you glad that He saved you? Let this be a warning to you, though, if you're in here today and you're lost. You're not going to hide behind this church. You're not going to hide behind this church. If you're in here today and you're lost, your, your little church membership ain't going to save you. If you're in here today and you're lost, your mama ain't going to be a good lawyer. There are a lot of people who say, well, my mama was a Christian lady. She raised me up in church. Your mama ain't going to be your lawyer at the Great White Throne Judgment. You say, well... My preacher was this or my preacher was that. Well, your preacher ain't going to be your lawyer in heaven. Ain't nobody going to be your lawyer in heaven. But Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. If you're saved, he is sitting at the right hand of the Father and he is the best lawyer you could ever have. He is risen, risen. He's making intercession for you and for me. He is risen, sitting on the right hand of God, making intercession for you and me. Risen, 
totally victorious. How big of a sinner am I? I'm such a sinner that it took the blood of Jesus Christ, God's own Son, to save me. How much does God love me? Enough to send His own Son to die for me. What a thing. How secure is our salvation? Powerful. The blood of Jesus Christ sealed our pardon. What a thing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, I pray for this message. I pray that we could be good ground. Help us to grow from this message. Help us to have a new new appreciation for your love. Help us to have a new appreciation for your mercy. Help us to have a new appreciation for what you did for us on that old rugged cross. Help us to have a totally new appreciation for that bodily resurrection. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the old rugged cross for you, for, for, for me and, and these people, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for paying for my sins on that old rugged cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Every head bowed and all eyes closed. I don't want anybody looking. <coughs> Maybe you're in here today and you're saved. You know you're saved. But you realize through the preaching of this message that you, what it took to save you. You realize through the preaching of this message that you have a totally new appreciation for the Lord. I hope that is the case. Maybe you're in here today and you say, I want to walk closer to the Lord today. I want to have a closer walk with Him because He gave it all for me. And I want to have a closer walk with, with Him. Why don't you come and lay your, your burden at the altar today? Why don't you lay it before the Lord? Maybe you're in here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Maybe you've never trusted Him as your Savior. I invite you to come and accept Him as your Savior today. Jesus died for you and rose from the grave on the third day. Why don't you trust Him as your crucified and buried and risen Savior? Why don't you come?